ಹಾಗು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಜೀಯಾಡೇ ವಿ ಲುಕ್ ಆಟ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಸಿವಿಲೈಸೇಷನ್ a wonderful book and uh, i'm really glad to have uh, the author pavan varma here with us and atveta kala who is going to be in discussion with him um pavan varma as we all know is a former parliament advisor to the chief minister of bihar and the author of several books best selling books including one of the first which i'd read uh, the great indian middle class Uh, his brilliantly argued new book the great hindu civilization is an essential treatise for our times he says in it the term hindutva stands discredited because of the illiterate bigotry that is sanctioned in its name hindu hinduism sorry hindutva must be replaced by hindu satya the truth about hinduism hinduism needs major reforms in order to match the civilizational legacy that we've inherited and the hallmark of a great civilization a progressive civilization is to respect the basic dignity of human beings and to be egalitarian and inclusive and this i think is something that we need to emphasize especially in today's somewhat contentious times uh, this i think is also the single most critical and important factor that i seem to have picked up from uh, my reading at least of the book and uh, that this reviving or resurrecting of uh, the the revival of hinduism uh, where we seem to have been ignorant of our past and of our civilizational uh, the inheritance that we have uh, a lot of us don't seem to have read our basic texts and our knowledge is at best superficial or sketchy uh, and this could be dangerous so i am uh, looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have today uh where we discuss this and many other questions which advaita will bring up uh today it is teachers day the 5th of september and uh, so let's just emphasize the fact that knowledge is essential to understanding and to creating citizens who are modern and progressive uh, tolerant inclusive and uh, that as we talk and we hear today uh, many of the uh questions that will come up these are the things that we stand by um i'd like to introduce uh, advaita to you briefly as well uh she is an author screenwriter columnist uh she's written screenplays for some big brilliant films like kahani and jana and jani and i remember the first uh, best seller the book that you had written called uh, almost single i remember giving that to my own daughter when she was heading off to bombay on her first job uh, it seemed to me like something she ought to read when she goes there uh, i believe it sold uh, more than 150000 copies and has been widely translated uh, adveta uh, also is a, a, a regular commentator on television uh talks about social issues and she curates uh, uh birds count a festival of words and she also does a podcast called the democrat so over to you now adveta uh to please take this conversation forward thank you so much priti it's indeed a pleasure to be here and in conversation with pavan varma ji who um i really enjoy being in conversation with considering i am a hindutvavadi so <laughs> so i think this should be interesting uh, we come in all shapes and sizes and temperaments i want to i want to say that uh, before before we kind of say that hindutva is one thing and one thing alone i think uh, you know like everything else there is diversity in that as well and different uh, different connotations that we uh, that we abide by and and understand uh, but you know this book is absolutely incredible i had uh, the privilege of being in conversation with with uh, pavan ji before it released and i have to say that uh, you know he's of course uh, widely published and read author apart from all the other avatars and the caps he wears but i have to say pavan ji this book of yours is a seminar 
And, uh, you know, I say this uh, not with rancor, but with a certain amount of disappointment that we have not, at least in our academic um, study and in our general conversations and public discourse, uh, really uh, discussed Hindu civilization and its contribution in the nuanced way that we need to. And what I think your book brings to this conversation is nuance, knowledge, research, and, and a certain... Um, explanation of of uh, you know the contributions of the civilization without being triumphant in any way and i and i just love that about this book because uh, you know that's really all uh, most of us really want is to is to understand where we come from a little better and uh, we've sort of been systematically denied that uh, for some obscure reasons uh, and i think uh, that's where uh, and you and you challenge those reasons in your introduction when you speak of uh, this idea of sex Secularism and the fact that an exploration of Hindu civilization could in some way erode that idea. So over to you, Pavanji. Well, thank you, Adveta. As I said, it's a great pleasure to be in conversation with you again. <laughs> it's important to be in conversation with someone as cerebral as you and who I know has read the book and will ask me searching questions and put me on the mat. I also want to thank Maja House for this opportunity and to say that whenever possible, I will certainly also come to Amritsar. To come back to your question, uh, Advaita, uh, your very name is Advaita, non-doer. And I believe that there is so much to Hindu civilization that we are not aware of. Uh, which we need to discover, which we need to discover because in many respects, it's a treasure house lying at our threshold and yet we seem to be incurious about it, if not indifferent. So one of the attempts of this book is that we discover that, that civilization, which is marked by great antiquity, by continuity, by peaks of refinement, by by diversity, by assimilation, and we, we try and see from it what are the things that can make us legitimately proud without being chauvinistic about it. There are many naysayers about this civilization, and there's a reason for that. A uh, uh, great many of them believe that any tribute to the legitimate and verifiable achievements of Hindu civilization will reinforce or bolster the ultra-right Hindu rhetoric or narrative today. Uh, and I have argued in my book that these are two separate issues. One is where you feel essential to counter the ultra-Hindu right, like you counter extremisms in all religions. Right. The second, the second issue is whether in order to reinforce your at attempt to counter this narrative, you need to devalue, demean, or denigrate the verifiable and legitimate achievements of the past. And I believe that is not necessary. So, therefore, I, I set out to, to separate the two. And in this process, there are people who are iconic in stature, whom I question also, including uh, Amartya Sen, right. uh, who are well-intentioned perhaps in their beliefs and what they say, but I believe it is uh, intertwining two arguments in a manner which is not necessary. So that is why uh, I think there's a lot to discover in this civilization. I could, in the course of our conversation, speak of some of the highlights. But that is one of the reasons which I believe uh, we need to 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 reestablish, mm -hmm. to reestablish with a sense of humility, without xenophobia or chauvinism, some of the legitimate achievements of Hindu civilization. And and by the way, let me add here: it's not without its blemishes, and my book dwells on them as well. But I believe a civilization cannot be judged only on the basis of its blemishes. Mm -hmm. There's no civilization that is unblemished. 
So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, Pavanji, you know, recently, uh, just to dip into current affairs for a little bit, uh, Nasiruddin Shah has been in the news because of his comment about Indian Islam and uh, the fact that, you know, there is, a, there is a, it is different from its counterparts in other, kind, uh, in other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, the Indic, Indic religions, the Indic uh, civilizational ethos has in some ways uh, made, made that difference. Uh, what do you have to say about this? Of course, he has been heavily attacked for even suggesting something like this and uh, by extremes on both sides, uh, they've gone after him. Well, I don't want to make a comment because my I'm not fully informed on everything that Nasiruddin Shah said, but if you are talking in the context of his comments on the Taliban, and mm -hmm. Indian Islam. Am I right? That is your... That's right. That's right. And and also, in, uh, you know, the intermingling, uh, which uh, which is something that you discuss as well, uh, mm -hmm. between uh, between the faiths in the subcontinent. Well, I, I really think that, uh, uh, frankly, I am appreciative of his statement. You may question it in its finer details, but I believe with the outright projection of a belief that India is not uh, likely to become caught in the holocaust of fanaticism and mm -hmm. whether it's Muslims or Hindus, uh, they will resolutely eschew that line. Mm -hmm. It's a well-intentioned thought and I believe we need to take it on board and hope that it's true. Uh, certainly I will say this, that uh, when Islam, the Turkic invaders, came to India, there's uh, no doubt, and I again said the, try to set the record straight in my book, that they came as uh, uh, with a great deal of destruction in their wake. There was plunder, there was loot, there was destruction, there was uh, the desecration of great number of centers of Hindu art, learning, and spirituality and religion. Uh, so there's no point on airbrushing or uh, glossing over the facts of history. But it is equally true that in the several centuries of this interface between Hinduism and Islam, there developed in due course a syncretic culture now, the mistake people make, Advaita, is to say either or. Mm -hmm. To either say there was only destruction and thereby to devalue that syncretic aspect of the later development, or to say that only syncreticism or Ganga Jamani Tezi was important and let us not talk about the destruction and loot and plunder that uh, also was a pact. My viewpoint about the past, I'm coming to the present, about the past is that you must accept the facts of history, reconcile with them, and move on towards the imperatives of the republic to build a modern, progressive, and inclusive republic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't do that, you are likely to create a backlash, and it's dishonest apart from anything else. Uh, how, how do you, in what weighing scale, do you make it either or? Uh, if the destruction of Nalanda in the course of uh, this uh, Islamic uh, conquest led to the library burning for 18 months, mm -hmm. which was so rich in treatises, that's one aspect of history. The fact that Khayal music, for instance, evolved as a result of the interface in the field of classical music and is a highly beautiful and enriching addition to the oeuvre of Indian classical music. That's another fact of history. Both have their place. It's not either or or. And I do believe that just as uh, this kind of syncretism took place, there were aspects of Islam which also were influenced by the, the, the Indic milieu of... Uh, of uh, Bharat, of India. I mean, uh, I can say for this that the Bhakti movement, I believe, had a great influence in the evolution of the Sufi movement. Mm -hmm. And I argue, argue that in my book. Yes. And uh, uh, the Bhakti movement, for instance, was one of the most powerful movements that I could think of chronicling 
It lasted for 600 years. And uh, the manner in which Hinduism was relatively democratized during that period, the efflorescence of poetry, the, art, the ardent devotion, fervor, the, 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 the bottom-up rather than top-down form of religion, the reinvention and transformation of Hinduism, uh, the, the passion and devotionalism, I think had a great influence on the evolution of Sufi thought. So there is obviously some interface in that. And frankly, in my view, Nasiruddin Shah's statement, I see it as well-intentioned. I'm not aware of the reasons why it's been trolled, but I would support it. I do too, actually. Um, you know, Pavanji, I'm, I'm very curious to know there is this certain, uh, in this present time, this certain existential um, angst that, uh, you know, is brought to the forefront, I guess, it is even fueled by political discourse of, of, of Hindus, you know, and, and I find your book a very interesting and a very necessary intervention uh, when it comes to this conversation that we're having, because of the civilization has survived, despite, uh, you know, the invasions, the plundering, the looting, the things that we, we all know of, it has survived. What, what would you say of the, about this angst? And why do you think the civilization survived in a way that others, great civilizations of that era, even those that came after it, have not lived uh, to see the day today? So there are two questions you ask. Hmm. What is the reason or the nature of the angst felt by some Hindus or a great many Hindus, there are several reasons for it and they have happened over a course of time. And I actually speak of them in my book as well when I come to the modern part of the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, I cannot fully understand why Mahatma Gandhi, who is indeed a Mahatma, and I have only the greatest respect and veneration for him, supported the Khilafat. Right. Uh, uh, I believe there were voices even within the Congress party which believed that it was not necessary, but he did so. I cannot understand, for instance, why uh, some elements of the Congress party, including Gandhiji, downplayed the level of destruction and the uh, violence of the Mopla riots and try to give them a justification. Right. There is Hindu angst also because after uh, independence, uh, there was a feeling that the government was going out of the way to if not appease, but to reassure Muslims at the cost of legitimate Hindu sentiments. When Jawaharlal Nehruji, again for whom I have great respect and admiration, wrote to Dr. Rajen Prasad that he should not, or it would be advisable for him not to attend the inauguration of the newly renovated Somnath Temple. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that a lot of Hindus felt that a temple that had been destroyed 17 times and was such a pivotal aspect of uh, religion as one of the primary, foremost important Jyotirlings. If it's renovation, they didn't feel somehow that if the president in his personal capacity as a Hindu since secularism in India was never interpreted to be an absolute separation between the church and the state. If he went there in his own personal capacity, and as Dr. Rajin Prasad explained, he also went to other places of worship of other religion also in that capacity. Uh, if he went there, it would be inimical to secularism, but nevertheless, this became quite public, mm -hmm. Nehruji's reservation on the subject. I cannot understand uh, that uh, uh, why if you had to amend the personal law of any one community or religion, why the Hindu civil code, even though mm -hmm. some of its changes were well-intentioned, was singled out when the directive principles speak of a uniform civil code applicable to all religions. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there, is a, there was a considerable degree of discontent 
in the manner in which uh, the Shahbano judgment was uh, uh, superseded by an ordinance mm -hmm. merely on the basis that it would be it would militate against uh, minority support in an electoral sense mm -hmm. uh, there was also some legitimate anger at the silence of the left liberal spectrum at the 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 expulsion of the pundits from kashmir and uh, uh, the more or less uh, exodus from there including a considerable degree of uh, destruction and killings uh, there is also discontent on the ground that uh, Hindu places of worship are under government control, while others are not. Uh, so I can continue to give you uh, several reasons, but over time there was a feeling, mm -hmm. and this is what electoral politics perhaps dictates, that the powers that be were using the Muslims, saw them as a important vote bank, and therefore, there were policies adopted or statements made which were for minority as appeasement uh, and, and took the Hindus for granted. I concede that. But it's a quantum leap of logic from there to say that some of the excesses of the Hindu ultra-right today are justified as well. Uh, the answer is to correct that uh, uh, one end of the spectrum that perhaps went towards vote bank minority politics causing considerable discontent among Hindus and part of it and I believe was indeed true mm -hmm. and I give the reasons for that also in my book. So it's a nuanced argument, it's a, in my view a balanced argument where you take on board some of the what you call the existence, existential angst of the Hindus while at the same time uh, I make the point rather strongly that uh, it's a sacrilege for Hinduism to be reduced to a Wahhabi faith and that uh, uh, a matter of great worry is that large parts of Hindu leadership, both of the religion and civilization, seem to be today in uh, lumpen hands. Hmm. Uh, moving on, um uh, Pavanji, you know, you've also addressed uh, women and uh, you've uh, you've spoken about Gargi and, uh, you know, Draupadi in the Mahabharata. I'd like you to, you know, I, I always like you to say it in your own words because you say it so much more beautifully than I'll even be able to. And, and I think you make a good distinction. You say compared to what is there in our in our history, in our culture, in our civilization, vis-a-vis -vis what we have on the ground. So please. You know, uh, Dweta, both in terms of the incorrigible hierarchy of the caste system and gender disparity. Uh, there seems to be on the basis of the historical evidence I could access a uh, difference between the very early period of the evolution of Hindu civilization and developments within it later. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the caste system also now latest scientific reverse research points to DNA evidence that there was considerable interaction between the castes, including through marriage or upward or downward mobility, and that it was never so water compartmentalized it is right. as it is today. The very Vedic age that you're, you're speaking of. Yeah, in the first two millennia, certainly of in the civilization, and I will come to the date when it began to change also. Uh, Similarly, in the case of women, uh, there are several texts I quote, and then there is the passage in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which refers to a public assembly of uh, King Janak of Videha, where Gargi takes on the presiding sage of that period, Yagnavalkya, and uh, unintimidatedly makes a point and is not uh, satisfied until her queries are can are are uh, responded to. So, but that's not the only isolated example. 
people. There was Maitri as well. You saw how what a spirited lady Draupadi was, notwithstanding the uh, misfortune she had to go to in a still male-dominated society. But Cotillia's Arthashastra speaks of women in high positions of power. Uh, and, and there is evidence to the fact that women enjoyed a near status of respect until in the case of caste as well as women around the 2nd century CE, things in the case of caste began to congeal in a system which became inflexible and uh, perpetuated a great deal of exploitation, oppression, discrimination and inequality. Uh, and in the case of women, and I have no hesitation in pointing out to some texts of the Manusmriti around the 2nd century CE. And although the Manusmriti is not a consistent text, and there are often contradictions within it, but there are texts which seems to place women in an uh, unredeemingly subordinate position, which unfortunately were never challenged and continued to reinforce themselves. And therefore, I say that in the present context, one of the great two great challenges before Hinduism is like in the past to reinvent itself. You ask me why mm. Hinduism has not remained a museum relic. I think because for, for, for two reasons. One is Hinduism had a conquering eclecticism to it. It was less brittle, less, accommod less uh, hostile to diversity and mm. therefore it was able to reinvent itself uh, and 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 grow and transform uh, to face newer challenges as they came up i mean a religion for instance whose mahavakya is ekam satya vipraha bahuda vadanti the truth is one wise people call it by different names or a religion where uh, sages write in our ancient past millennia ago had the courage and audacity to say at a time when relatively nascent tribes believed that their world is the only world that matters and anything beyond it is sus suspect. Mm. To say, Ano Kritavo Yantu Vishwata. Let good thoughts flow to me from all from directions. directions. Mm. Yeah, it's, it requires courage. It requires right. uh, a certain vision. Or to say, similarly, Udara Charitana Vasudhev Kutumbukam. That the mm -hmm. world entire world is one family. This is the animating spirit of that Hinduism which refused to be reduced to a museum relic or an antiquity uh, and continued to revive and transform itself and reinvent itself to become as it were a Sanatan uh, dharm or a, and a civilization. So uh, uh, I think uh, that is the reason why it survived, and that is certainly the position, as I understand it, where women were concerned. Uh, yes. If I may just add that just as in the past it reinvented itself, I believe one of the great challenges before Hinduism today in, a, in, the, in the modern context is to once again introspect and look inwards with regard to the great inequalities of the caste system, which which many people misinterpret to be sanctioned by religion, and to look at gender disparity. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and and you know the other other thing that I'm I'm curious about. There's a certain strand in Hindu thought uh, right now, uh, which th which uh, thinks of Hindu as a cultural term and not necessarily a religious term. And uh, of course, uses the argument of Panth Nirpeksh as opposed to Dharm Nirpeksh because Dharm has a very different meaning uh, within the Hindu uh, understanding of it as opposed to, uh, you know, what it is translated as, which is loosely, they say, religion, which is not really how it is uh, understood. What do you have to say about this uh, strand of thinking? You see, Dharm means so many things in Hinduism. Uh, there are four, the four Purusharts, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. And one of the most fascinating aspects of, one, of, one aspect of Hindu civilization are these four Purusharts. And uh, the whole discussion on Dharma, uh, frankly, left me uh, 
uh, odd because uh, the easiest way of describing dharm as proper or appropriate conduct uh, at one level uh, we don't have anything like the 10 commandments which is there in these kind of commandments are there in abrahamic faith right hinduism yeah. hinduism uh, delineates a basic basic core of possible ethical conduct Mm-hmm. but then says that each act has to be judged in its context and circumstance mm-hmm. and cannot be uh, in black and white terms be dubbed absolutely right or absolutely wrong i mean one example is that if a man is uh, absolutely on the verge of death due to starvation and picks one apple from the tree of a rich man's orchard is it thieving or is it an act desperate act of survival it, it may be theft but is it condonable to what extent is it wrong or is there are there mitigating circumstances now dharm goes into these questions with a great deal of courage because the much easier way i believe is to issue a set of 10 commandments but hinduism refrains from that uh and and defines uh, good and bad in terms of contextuality which is why uh, yudhishthir is a little surprised when mythologically he reaches heaven and finds that his brothers and draupadi are in hell while duryodhan is in heaven so i'm just talking about the relativity of it this is uh, mm. uh or when uh, duryodhan dies the mahabharat says the heavens rain down flowers although in conventional terms he is the arch villain but mm-hmm. heavens rain down for flowers ki bahut bada yoddha tha uh, and similarly ravan's uh, is, is there is the, the, the attempt is not to etch a black and white portrait but to see it in context and to then see the background uh, in which certain acts are performed and why and if so to what extent are they completely wrong or possibly uh, in other contexts un- understandable so that is dharma at one level at another level it has come to be loosely translatable as religion and therefore perhaps the better word would be sarva uh, panth sambhav but mm. i think the basic basic fact that we have to understand is however you translate it in hindi Uh, or sanskrit is sarv dharm sambhav which means respect for all faiths this country cannot survive without that basic dictum because that is not only what hinduism is all about uh, a respect for diversity a tolerance and inclusiveness but also it is the compulsion of the manners in which we are constituted right questions are already coming in so i'm going to pop one in right now uh, from mr sanjoy hazarika uh, he's had four questions so i'll go with the first one what makes up for a good contemporary hindu well that's a difficult question to define just like hinduism is difficult to define completely but i would say uh, you have to be to be a good hindu in some respects adwaita Mm-hmm. aware of what the basic units of hinduism are you know hinduism does not make it mandatory for you to do so uh, uh you know it doesn't have a prescribed text it does not have one pope one place of worship primary place or supreme place of worship no uh, mandatorily prescribed ritual Uh, so it does become a way of life but i would say to you advaita that some knowledge of what the basic tenets of hinduism are i mean i'd give you random example what are the three foundational texts of hindu this remarkable document called the upanishads which is not in the nature of a fiat but a dialogue this remarkable document called the brahm sutra which again goes out of its way to admit in its analysis of a proposition the opponent's view point in other words the opposer's point of view 
of the Bhagavad Gita and its philosophy of the Nishkam Karma. Uh, at least some idea of this should be known. It's important, for instance, to, for Hindus, in order to be able to, to, to be more authentically Hindu, I'm not talking in ritualistic terms, but to know that in Hinduism, at least in the area of spirituality and metaphysics, there's no one system of philosophy, but six systems of philosophy. Uh, you know, the Nyaya, the Vaisheshik, the Sankhya, the Yog, the Purva Mishan, the Purva Mimansh and the Uttar Mimansh. And to know further the amazing truth that uh, they can all technically be called atheists. Not that I'm asking Hinduism to be atheist, but to know that they can technically be called atheists because remarkably enough, they are not talking of divinity in conventional terms. They are not talking of God. Their search is for what could be the ultimate truth behind the bewildering plurality of the cosmos. So it's quite remarkable. Or to take that great balance between Nirgun and Sagun. What does it mean in Hinduism? At one level, most practicing Hindus would say that uh, God is imminent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent in everything. Uh, uh, that is Brahm. Akhand, mm. Adrisht, Achintya, you know, undifferentiated consciousness. Nirvishesh, Chin, Matram, Sarva, Pratyay, Darshanin, supremely intellectual, there in animate and inanimate things pervading the cosmos. Mm. At the other level, and Nirgun without attributes, and at the other level, we extravagantly humanize our gods. We celebrate their marriage, their birth of their children. We give them all kinds of attributes, including four arms and many other uh, uh, symbols. Uh, is there a contradiction? Or is it that once you are firmly rooted in the immanence of the Almighty, you believe that because of that, you can let human imagination uh, in a sense uh, have a uh, field day in terms of the attributes you give at the level of conventional divinity. Now, this, these are things which you need to know. You, you, you need to know, for instance, in Hinduism, why the Charvaks are still considered Hindu. Mm. The Charvak school, which is the materialist school, uh, actually said that the Vedas are uh, more or less uh, rubbish, load of rubbish. And, 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 and religion is meant only to exploit the masses. Something which Marx said much later was said by the Charvaks millennia earlier. And yet Charvaks are also part of Hinduism. So there are things which you must understand, not the least, uh, I want to say, Advaita, to counter those who believe that they are the new thekdars of Hinduism, that their knowledge, mm. which is usually, uh, you know, their uh, activism, their evangelism is usually in inverse proportion to their knowledge. Mm. Uh, the more they wish to do, the less they know. Uh, they are averse to dialogue. They are usually far too orthodox and conservative. I mean, in the land of the Kama Sutra, uh, and Khajraho and Konarak, uh, they go about imposing a Victorian morality on young couples in gardens and consider it protection of Hinduism. They don't know <laughs> what's the role of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha in mm. the four parts and how it has been outlined and explained. Um. So they are usually over orthodox, they are usually patriarchal, they are far too conservative, they are mostly upper caste. They are prone to violence. They take the law into their own hands. I mean, this kind of grouping, if they, when they say to you, to women, I say in particular, this is how you, what you should wear, this is what you should not, this is how you are regarded as a chaste Hindu, and this is what you are not supposed to do, what you should speak, what you should eat, what you should wear, what you should drink. This is not Hinduism. To counter it, you must be able to speak of Hinduism in authentic terms a little more eloquently, based on actual knowledge. That, I think, would be, in some respects, a true Hindu. 
I agree. And that's why I think your book is so important. I've not only read it, but I bought it for a couple of people as well. And I think it's essential reading. Uh, you know, I, I, one thing that we haven't addressed, and you started off this conversation by making a reference to uh, Professor Amartya Sen, who is, who is uh, uh, you know, uh, argumentatively, I guess, uh, one of the finest minds that the country has produced in the present time. Uh, how much of uh, his approach and uh, his uh, to this to the uh, to civilizational history and our uh, inheritance do you think comes from uh, another hot topic hot button topic in the present day which is a decolonizing of uh, the Hin indian mind or the hindu mind so how much of it is instinctual how much of it is ideological you know what is quite amazing is that dr amart sen is the sanskrit scholar Hmm. No one knows more about, uh, I mean, few people know as much about Hinduism as he does. And he's the one who points out to the great level of eclecticism within Hinduism. Uh, the fact that no one has been burnt on a stake for heresy within Hinduism. The reason why Adi Shankaracharya could say, the reinventor of Hinduism, commit blasphemy and say, uh, Shivoham, Shivoham, I am Shiva, I am Shiva. When Anul Haq was said by someone in the Middle East a century later and he, he was beheaded. This is Hinduism and uh, uh, Amartya Sen knows it. And yet, it's not about decolonizing the mind. It's about an obsession about what he fears to be uh, a distortion that is creeping in the present that enables him to devalue, devalue what has happened in the past. Now, I, I do not think that argument is valid. These are two separate issues, as I said right in the beginning. I mean, he goes to the extent of saying, for instance, that when you talk in the context of Hindu civilization, I take up some of the arguments that people give, that there's no such word as Hindu, uh, that if there is, there is no such civilization as Hindu. If there's yeah. a civilization, Amartya Sen says, why not call it a Buddhist civilization? Because for a thousand years, according to him, it was a dominantly Buddhist, which it was not. Uh, to try and paint an adverse serial position between Hinduism and Buddhism, mm -hmm. and to try and devalue the essential template of Hinduism, even for the great religions that came emanated from it, like Buddhism and Jainism and later Sikhism, uh, is, I believe, uh, a very, very far-stretched argument. Uh, he even goes to the extent of saying that Panini, the great grammarian, was mm -hmm. not Hindu. He was, uh, he was uh, he, Afghani because he was born on the banks of the Kabul River in Afghanistan. Conveniently forgetting that at that time, that part of Afghanistan was a part of the Mauryan Empire. So, I mean, you can stretch an argument up to a point. Uh, for instance, on, he will dismiss offhand mm -hmm. any evidence of predating Hindu civilization on the basis of what I believe, and I'm a historian and I don't have any particular bias one way or the other, of credible verified, mm -hmm. tested, scientific data available uh, on several aspects, including the history and antiquity of the Saraswati River, which predates the origins of Hindu civilization by at least a millennium, if not more. But he will dismiss it straight away as an attempt by a Hindutva fundamentalist to glorify or over glorify our past as a conspiracy of these minds. So I I I, I counter this. I, I I counter these facts. Hmm. There is a question from uh, Sarabjot Espel. He wants to know: It is evident from your discourse that you you acknowledge the need for renaissance for the Hindu way of life in present times. What do you think could be the cardinal principles on which this revival and rediscovery need to be based on? Well, first is knowledge. I'm afraid, given the challenges today of the distortion of Hinduism, 
those who believe that hinduism is a great religion and the civilization associated with you has many many wisdoms that need to be preserved and certainly remembered and to some extent adopted today uh, within the secular realm, realm as well they there has to be knowledge the renaissance must include a little more knowledge that you at least know the meanings of some of the rituals you perform in terms of their symbolisms uh, it can't be completely deracinated so knowledge is, is certainly a very important uh, aspect of that renaissance and i don't know how we can meet that challenge but it would require hindus themselves to introspect mm. uh, about the need for it secondly i think we need for that renaissance to look at some of the blemishes in hinduism which prevent it from taking its legitimate place among the modern egalitarian great civilizations and religions of the world which is unfortunately social discrimination the caste hierarchy which is gender discrimination uh, uh, a few miles out of delhi we have uh, uh, groups that can legislate against women in today's era in spite of the constitution and our laws we have the highest rate of female feticide i think hinduism is a religion that needs to, to once again echo what the great plea for reform within hinduism as the next step forward made not only by swami vivekananda dr ambedkar mahatma gandhi jyotibai phule and others but also by veer savarkar that aspect of veer savarkar is never remembered today that he was the most uh, consistent and resilient reformer about hinduism and he wrote as much about that as he did in passing about hindu rashtra and that too was said in a certain context at that time so these are the things that hinduism needs to take up to to to, to once again have that renaissance mm-hmm. you know how much how much of it uh, you know this uh, this synchronous uh, you know the synchronization of thought and belief is possible with hindus because this is not a faith that congregates or worships together necessarily in the way the abrahamic faiths do on the other hand oh, you know we are also um, hindus are also a faith if you look at it from the faith perspective where Allah, you know i mean it used to be the pagans really who used to worship goddesses and so many in such numbers we're the only living faith right now that really worships goddesses in so much in so many numbers and such variety and yet like you rightly mentioned you know there are the issues of female feticide there is the issue of gender discrimination the caste casteism how do how do we kind of you know it's it's so it's so confusing almost in a way this, that this dichotomy can exist and thrive and uh, yet right. you know hindus in the face that you pay owed i mean hinduism as as has been said by scholars there is no other religion which pays such a great deal of homage and obeisance to the devi mm-hmm. and there are texts like the devi mahatmya which says that even above the male deity is the female principal shakti or devi in such a country you have a situation where the subordination of women is unbelievable so therefore uh, i think that uh, there has to be introspection within hindus themselves i'm not saying nothing has changed at that some things have changed progressive mm-hmm. laws have come into being gradually women are far more emancipated today in many fields they have been given places of equal respect and have performed even better than men in spite of that i would say hindus need a change in mindset and that has been spoken about by those whom we revere swami vivekanand dr ambedkar as i just mentioned mahatma gandhi they were all social crusaders because they saw it as the priority for hinduism to reinvent itself in today's context mm-hmm. 
Sangamitra Malik is asking, what is the difference between being a Hindu and a Hindutwadi? We see Hindutwadis demeaning our minorities and only having hatred for others, which is very sad in today's context. Please show us the book. I have, I have no problem with the word Hindutva if it means to be the essence of Hindus. I have a lot against the political manifestations of Hindutva, especially when it manifests itself as bigotry, hatred, violence, and exclusion. Because I believe it goes against the essential core spirit of Hinduism itself. This does not make Hinduism a passive religion. Mm. But this, this violence and bigotry is antithetical to Hinduism because Hinduism is not an Abrahamic faith. And yet the Hinduism is not going anywhere. In Indonesia, which was largely Buddhist and Hindu, the Islamic invaders came and in 150 to 200 years, the entire island became almost entirely Muslim. Right. We have had 600 years of Muslim rule in this country. And they became part of the Indian fabric and soil. And we had the British rulers. And Hinduism has continued to reinvent itself and, 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 and flourish and remain intact. So I have problems with this distortion of Hinduism as represented in the political manifestations of Hindutva by <laughs> certain elements who misunderstand Hinduism and have reduced it to their lumpen understanding of our great religion and civilization. Hmm. Um, Indu Arora is actually more of a comment than a question, which is uh, India was such a progressive country with diverse religions all living amicably. Today, the entire fabric of the country is hatred. I think... Well, it's something that we need to think about. And just like the, there was a movement called Not In My Name, I will say not in the name of Hinduism, for God's sake. If you wish to nurture hatred within you, mm. do so. I mean, Tulsi Das in the Ramcharit Manas, the one advice Ram says I will give to Lakshman, he says, Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par peeda sam nahi atmai. There is no greater religion than doing good for others and no greater sin than providing injury to others. This is Sri Ram in mm. Tulsidas saying to Lakshman what is the nature of his wisdom. Mm. Pavanji, some of the young, uh, young Hindutva activists on uh, social media especially say Hindutva is Hinduism that resists. How do you respond to that? Because there is, uh, again, you know, it comes down to uh, the fact that there is a feeling of, uh, you know, all the things that you mentioned, you know, temples not being in control of the of, of people, the kind of appeasement that they have seen in politics. So they say Hindutva is Hindus, Hinduism that resists. I see it's perfectly all right for Hindus to resist what they believe is injustice. Hmm. Yeah. If it's not a level playing field from the point of Hindus, it's perfectly legitimate for them to raise their voice and say, we need, if you want to have respect for all faiths, let it be respect for all faiths and not only certain uh, policies of appeasement mm -hmm. for electoral purposes. Let them say it. Resistance is not wrong. In what form do you manifest that resistance? And that too in the name of Hinduism. There is something wrong in the many manifestations of that. And I don't want to go into details or give examples. Okay. So it's, it's not about, as I said earlier, Hinduism is not a passive religion. You can raise your voice. And we are, we are, and you can say that there cannot be a dialogue with someone else who does not wish to have a dialogue. But I say Hinduism has survived, has prevailed, because of its conquering eclecticism, because it is dialogic to its core. I, I mentioned to you in passing that the Upanishads are a dialogue, the Brahm Sutra are a dialogue, the Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue. Uh, the famous dialogue between Adi Shankaracharya and Mandan Mishra, 
between the gyan marg and the karm kand marg to completely opposed people was on the basis of dialogue they didn't break each other's heads hmm hmm and ultimately you have prevailed in the past you will prevail for the cause of justice which you believe is your right but taking law into your own hands hmm gratuitous violence hatred bigotry exclusion the derogation of women uh, hmm. the, the attempt to legislate in the name of hinduism without knowing its essential tenets i mean some of these people who speak for hinduism i'd like to lock into a room and ask them to write a two page essay on hinduism and i doubt if they'll be able to pass <laughs> there is a tendency for those voices to be amplified i think across faiths not just in the hindu faith but you know before i let you go one out of syllabus question uh, because i think uh, i mean you're phenomenal in, uh, on that subject which is adi shankaracharya uh, i might i must say that you had at, at my event about 500 plus hindu tvadis listening quietly for over an hour when you spoke so you know just a little bit on uh, shankaracharya's contribution to the survival of hindu civilization no i think uh... you see one of the things that dwaita have always said is and that is also one reason for in answer to your question without making any adverse comparison hinduism and hindu civilization is a very cerebral cerebral these are cerebral institution there's application of mind there's mm -hmm. great ideation there is the courage to state a position irrespective of easier options before it and adi shankaracharya's seminal contribution was to take your namesake belief advaita and to elaborate upon it in a manner which was so intellectually thorough and at the same time he was a great civilizational figure i mean here is a man who was born in kaladi in kerala and took samadhi in kedarna he lived up to the age of 32 and in the process in the 8th century ad he set up four mats one at shringeri in the south one at dwarka in the west one at puri in the east and one at badrinath joshi mat in the north i mean it's a civilizational map of india and it traversed the land by foot not once but several times mm -hmm. so it's a yeah. remarkable life with a remarkable corpus of deep cerebral thought and some of the most amazing stotras and hymns uh, which you are all familiar with whether it's uh, the nirvan shatakam or uh, bhaj govindam or and so this whole balance between the nirgun and sagun so i think uh, it was a turning point in the intellectual evolution of hindus and that's all from me thank you so much we're already at 7 pm and uh, we've run out of time it always goes by so quickly when i'm in conversation with you because uh, mm -hmm. you can make the most dense subjects accessible and i can't i can't recommend your book enough and uh, really it's it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you and to have you creating this work because i think it nourishes the soul and um, it helps refine one's thinking and system of beliefs even if you don't agree 100% uh, you know there are there are things in this book which which just makes so much sense especially because like i began i don't say this with rancor but i say this with disappointment that we unfortunately just don't study enough about our civilization through our traditional methods of education so thank, thank you, you uh, mr pavan there is entirely my uh, to show the book again so i'm going to just do that here Oops. Sangha Mitra, here it is, and anybody else, and highly recommended. Please do order your copy on Amazon. And I'll now ask Guru Pratap to uh, please come and do a formal formal vote of thanks to you. Uh, thanks, Priti. Thanks, and uh, a very good evening to Pavanji and Advaita Ji. Uh, Pavanji, I have a, a 
read your collaborations with Gulzar Sahib and your translations of his poems. And this book is quite a departure from all that you have written for him. And uh, this was a wonderful dis discussion, really. And uh, following just this, this side of uh, controversial. <laughs> and uh, you have made us once more proud of our rich heritage. The great Hindu civilization is something to be cherished. Even during our school days, we were taught about our diverse and magnificent cu culture. But somehow, as we grew up, we also grew alienated from our roots. Blindly, we aped the Western culture, considering it superior to ours. Our curiosity also about our uh, civilization also dimmed somewhere along the way. But your book, Timely As It Is, is an eye-opener, making us remember that we have a lot to look back upon and to resurrect and to learn from so we can make our lives holistic and rich. And this is a very sensitive and controversial subject, but it is to your credit that you have remained unbiased and critical in your perspectives and writings. You have not just eulogized the past, but also recommended corrections and rectifications in our culture where required. It is a frank and unhesitating vision hearkening to a bygone era of magnificence. And here I must thank you, Advaita, for your very insightful and incisive questions without which a conversation can fall flat. <coughs> Once again, on behalf of Maja House, I thank all of you today, Pavanji, you, Advaita ji, you, and our wonderful audience who remained in touch and in sync with the whole conversation and asked such uh, uh, contentious questions. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everyone, for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, before we close, please join us at six o'clock on Saturday, the 11th. Uh, we have another wonderful book and a wonderful discussion. Uh, the book is The Influences of the British Raj on the Attire and Textiles of Punjab uh, oh. by Jasinda Kaur. Please do join us. Uh, we will be sending out the Zoom link to everybody who writes in to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Mr. again. Bhatna. Thank you, Advaita. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, audience, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.